a small startup fund whose big backers include Peter Thiel and Bill Ackman has a message for corporate America. Stay out of politics. Joining us now is Strive Asset Management's founder, Vivek Ramaswamy. He's also author of the New York Times bestseller, uh, Woke Incorporated. Vivek, it's, it's good to have you on today. Uh, so the, the idea is excellence, in your view, over ideology. And, and I think in a nutshell, um, you think all stakeholders can be satisfied uh, by a company just focusing on satisfying its consumers and its employees rather than, than maybe uh, delving into ESG. It's kind of the anti-ESG you're launching, is it not? Well, I, I find it difficult to be anti-ESG when I, when I find it very difficult to even define what ESG means today. But here's actually what we do stand for is a message to corporate America to focus on excellence over politics. If you're an oil company, be an excellent oil company. If you're a coal company, be an excellent coal company. And if you're a solar company, be an excellent solar company. But we're not going to tell, for example, oil companies not to be oil companies. And, and Joe, this relates to, I think, a, what I call a fiduciary issue with the top asset managers in the world. And what I think is happening today is a problem where the biggest asset managers on the planet, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, I think they're using their clients' capital to advocate for viewpoints in the boardrooms of corporate America that most of their own clients disagree with. That's a sort of fiduciary breach. And there is so much capital concentrated in the hands of just those three firms, 20 trillion, more than the GDP of the United States, that the real problem is when that much capital is concentrated in one set of hands or in a few hands that are advocating for one ideology, we lack the true diversity of thought that the American economy depends on and that our capital markets depend on. So that's what we're hoping to fix at Strive. What, Vivek, and I, I did a little uh, a look at ESG and performance. Would you say that the, the just in terms of, of not looking at it in terms of value or value judgment or ideology, it, it, it doesn't outperform. I mean, you can feel good. I guess, theoretically, I guess you can feel good about it. But it is, are there studies that are in where the, we can just close the door and say, absolutely, ESG does not work any better than anything else and maybe works worse? Do you know? Yeah, well, look, I think there is, it's clear that there's no evidence that ESG outperforms, despite the claims made by some of the world's largest asset managers and their CEOs. There's no evidence to support that fact. Of course, people on both sides of this debate are going to cherry pick data to support their own views. But our perspective at Strive and my personal perspective is that many of the underlying companies are actually performing more poorly because of what these large shareholders, and I use shareholders in quotes because it's not really their money, it's the money of their clients, but what these large asset managers are telling these companies to do. Exxon actually suffered a, a proxy battle that caused it to reduce its oil production. I think Exxon would be a more successful company today if it were actually drilling for more oil than it was before BlackRock and Engine Number 1 told Exxon to go in a different direction. And I think that there were bad externalities for the American economy, for our reliance on Russian oil. There are geopolitical consequences that cause consumers to pay higher prices at the pump. And part of what we're exposing is the fact that it's the money of everyday American citizens that's being used to advance this ideology that most of them actually disapprove of. And that's a disconnect that we have to address. And one way to look at it, Joe, is if you've got the CEOs of Exxon, Shell, Chevron, and ConocoPhillips in a room, say, and they coordinated to say we're going to reduce gas production and gas prices spike as a result, that'd be the stuff of movies. There'd be handcuffs. People would be locked up on antitrust violations. Yet today, when the largest owners of those firms effectively direct them and mandate them to do the same thing, somehow that gets celebrated as ESG instead. That's a problem. But, but we think the right Vivek, solution is competition. That's what we're bringing to the table. Vivek, I, I think that's it. I just want to put out the devil's uh, uh, the other side of this, which is potentially, A, that there is a marketplace that all these funds can do what they want. And all these oil companies, I mean, I would argue to you to some degree it's a straw man. Given where oil prices are today and what apparently people think oil prices are going to be over the next five years, 10 years, you would think that every oil company in, in the world would be out there uh, making new drilling plans and doing all sorts of things. But they're not. Why not? I'm not I'm I think not convinced it's because BlackRock is telling them not to. I think that there's a economic argument that they have made to themselves, whether you think it's a good economic argument or not is a different question. But it's not yeah. solely because BlackRock is screaming at them. 
Well, it's not solely because BlackRock. You also have the largest other asset managers in the world basically saying the same thing. BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. But when your top shareholders all tell you to do the same thing, the, sh- the, the classical dogma tells us that the shareholders ultimately have power to direct the way the firm ultimately operates. That's what we're seeing today. But the real problem, Joe, is that the people who claim to be the shareholders, the BlackRocks, the Vanguards, the State Streets, they are not the actual shareholders It is their client bases that would want Exxon and Shell and Chevron to be behaving in different ways than they are today. That's the disconnect that I think that we need to address. And part of what we're missing here is that there is no diversity in the marketplace of ideas and capital markets today. It is one monolithic ideology, stakeholder capitalism. And our view is that clients actually deserve more choice. That if you're a client and you have an investment manager who allocates your money. Why do you think that that's the case? Meaning... If all why why do you think that these four firms, which you think control the market effectively, all have the exact same view? Isn't that a result to some degree of what they what they must think the customer wants? You would think that if the customer didn't want this, they would be doing something else. Yeah, well, so there's two reasons why. I mean, I think one is we live in a very intermediated, non-transparent financial system where most everyday clients, the firefighters, the nurses, the doctors, the entrepreneurs, business owners, whose money is actually being invested by their intermediaries, they don't know that their money actually ends up in the hands of three asset managers that vote their shares and advocate on their behalf in ways that they disagree with. So I think the non-transparency is a big part of it. And you say the market should fix this. I agree with you. That's why I think we're bringing a market solution to bear that actually gives those consumers an added choice. Now, there's a deeper reason, and I talk about this in my book. I think some of this dates back to the 2008 financial crisis, where after the 08 crisis, there was a new demand of American capitalism in this country. Occupy Wall Street was on Wall Street's doorstep. And there were certain opportunists who spotted that moment and said, we're going to jump on that and build a business with this new vision of ESG-centered stakeholder capitalism. Congrats to BlackRock. They were one of those firms. They built a business over the last 10 years on the back of that philosophy. I think the people of this country are hungry for something new now. That's what we're delivering is a new focus in corporate America that recenters the focus on excellence for the customer over every other agenda, including divisive political agendas. And on a personal note, the thing that motivates me is I think that that's not only going to be good for our capital markets. I think it's going to be unifying for our corporate culture. I think it's going to be unifying for our country. And my bet is, I think a lot of customers, not everyone, we don't think every client should come to us, just like every client shouldn't go to BlackRock or Vanguard. But many clients, if not most people in this country, are going to get behind that message. That's what motivates me to take the step. How did you, uh, how did you uh, develop a relationship with Peter Thiel, Bill Ackman? Is Joe Lonsdale part of, uh, or one of the funds part of this as well? Those guys ideologically seem like they're on the same uh, page with you. How did, how did that come about, Vivek? Well, look, we actually, and you mentioned some of our backers right there, that's included, the three of them are amongst others. We actually have a diverse, politically diverse, diverse in every way set of backers, as well as employees at the company. But everyone is behind the common mission of reviving the unapologetic pursuit of excellence in corporate America. I think that's something we've missed with this new apologist model of capitalism. And and look, I think the people, as I said, are, are hungry for this new movement in the country where there is this gap where the American people whose capital is being invested aren't being heard in corporate boardrooms across the country. That's what we're going to fix in part by engaging directly with those companies, bringing a diverse voice to the table. And I think that was something that was motivating to a lot of the folks who have read my book. I think most of our backers had read my book, read my work on the pages of The Wall Street Journal over the last year and recognized that we can move the needle a little bit by talking about it. But if we really want to move the needle, we're going to have to do something about it. A funny story, Joe, is actually the Manhattan Institute invited Larry Fink and I to a debate a couple. It was last year or the year before on stakeholder capitalism. I accepted. He declined. At the end of the day, I figured that if people aren't going to be talking about these issues in the open, then the best way to solve the problem is really to give the choice to the market and to the everyday investor and to the citizens of this country. And I predict that many of them are going to be happy about the movement that we're building. Right. We shall see, because the, the journal has had some other, I think the editorial board itself has written about the notion of voting as an ETF manager, of voting your shares at, for your own personal uh, political or, or ideological uh, perspective is a little bit, it just, it's just kind of strange. Uh, but it's done, uh, as you said. Uh, Vivek, appreciate uh, having you on uh, this morning. Good luck with the fun. See you later. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Appreciate it.